Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's virtual plant clinic. I'm just getting us going on the live stream. There we go. Um, we have the recording going. Um, so I'm just going to stop for a moment while we wait for everybody to get logged in. While we are waiting on all of our audience to join, uh, for those of you who are new, to these classes. Uh, you're going to be able to ask questions today if you are on our Zoom webinar. Uh, if you joined us through the Eventbrite platform, you can ask questions by um, opening up the Q&A box and typing those questions in there, and I will be monitoring those during the class. If you are on Facebook, I'm also monitoring our Facebook comments, so uh, you're welcome to ask questions there. Just know there can be a little bit of a delay before I see it, so it may take me a little bit longer to, to get to your question, but um, I think that about covers it for me. David is going to be covering, you're doing dogwoods and azaleas today, right, David? That is today's topic, absolutely. A celebration of spring bloom. Um, I know you have a lot to cover. I saw your slides, so I'm gonna I'm gonna let you uh, get started cranking through those. Great. Well, great to see everybody, and thank you, Sally. Um, as you kind of Sally mentioned, you know, we'd love to make this a dialogue and hear from you. So submit your questions um, throughout the program. I've tried to build in a couple breaks here for questions, but quite honestly, I feel like I've tried to squeeze two programs into one today. So I'm going to just jump right into it and kick things off here with my slide presentation. Uh, because here we are, you know, this is what I always call the kind of the iconic landscape combination uh, for our region uh, throughout here, D.C., Maryland, Virginia. Uh, the, the dogwood, flowering dogwood there is both our state tree and our state flower. And it's one of our most popular uh, landscape trees. And of course, it partners up beautifully with azaleas as their bloom times overlap. Um, we'll get into this about some of the different varieties and the culture, the care, touch on some of the pest issues, try to cover this as much as we possibly can. But I also thought it was interesting, we, um, we had just finished doing a, a little survey with uh, one of the master gardener groups that I'm a member with. And out of 196 respondents, I think we determined like 76% of them had a dogwood as the number one top, you know, tree in their landscapes. So that really speaks to the popularity of it and why it's going to be such a good topic today. So I'm going to run through some uh, specifically talk about dogwoods. And after that, we will talk about azaleas. So this is like I said, this is probably what the scene will be looking at another week maybe two weeks at most. Uh, dogwoods are just, just starting to emerge out. Um, azaleas are still tight in bud. So uh, we're talking about today, you still have some time, do some shopping, figure things out, and then you could create a combination like this in your own garden and get to enjoy it here as we start moving into April. So we'll just kick this off again, looking at taking a closer look at dogwoods. Uh, so the, Cornacy, the dogwood family, it's really, uh, boy, it's undergoing a lot of changes. Uh, starting about 10 years ago, the plant, uh, people doing all these genetic and DNA analysis and everything, relooking a lot of the plant world, restructuring stuff. This um, now has been split up into, I think, about four different um, genera and different families. The name of the flowering dogwood has changed. Uh, I'm too old to keep up with this stuff. So what we all grew up and what we've all learned and we all known as Cornus Florida has been renamed something like, I gotta look at my cheat sheet here, Bentham, Benthamidia, Florida. That's a mouthful and I'm just gonna stick with the old names on there. But it's, it's kind of cool that we're doing this because as the science progresses and develops, we're learning more about the relationships between plants. And again, these names and the changes are really there to better reflect the evolutionary and genetic relationship between the different plants. So um, again, I'm just saying, I know my information is outdated. It's changed a lot in the last 10 years, but you know what, it's gonna keep changing. So I'll, I'll wait till they get that stuff a little more settled out. But what we know is uh, Cornus Florida, flowering dogwood, again, our state tree, um, state flower for good reason. One of the things we can do for easy identification is that most of them do have that opposite leaf arrangement where uh, a lot of plants, most plants kind of have, you know, 
one leaf, one leaf, one leaf, one leaf, what we call alternate arrangement. Uh, dogwoods, they occur in pairs, you know, boom, 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 just like dogwoods, maples, ash, several other trees. Um, and then that shows you kind of the stature of it, that beautiful tree, kind of mid-sized, uh, usually wider than it is tall, and a little bit of a close-up on the flowers that we all know and love. One of the things that's so terrific about this, of course, is that it tends to flower before the leaves come out, so we can get a real good look at the bloom. And you'll see in this next image of the actual flower on here is that little, um, tiny little yellow flower that you see in the side of it. So the way uh, Cornish, Florida, the flowering dogwood, the way it blooms is this cluster of little yellow flowers inside of there. And they are subtended or surrounded by these large bracts, which are modified leaves. So it's really a very interesting structure that goes on there. And again, they are developed for different coloration and a lot of different uh, characteristics go in there. So they have beautiful flowers. And then as we take a look and see uh, how they progress through the year, uh, I also showing images here of how it's going to look in the fall. Uh, I think they get undervalued uh, sometimes for the fall coloration. So that deep red one in the foreground is our native dogwood. And that's the hickory that's behind it showing it off so well. Also a gorgeous native tree, but really that, um, that dogwood. You know, so beautiful flowers in spring, nice kind of medium sized tree in the landscape, great fall coloration, and also the berries, uh, which is a nice, uh, additive, you know, because then again, that provides food and resources for the wildlife that's going there. So this really is just an amazing tree and no surprise why it's so popular in our landscape. Uh, there's many, many varieties and I've got my next picture, just a couple examples of some of the varieties that are out there. Uh, and these are really selected for big showy blossoms on it. It's prolific and also color variations. So when I start talking about varieties or cultivars, what happens is you can say, you know, corn is Florida, just the native dog with this growing out in the woods and we go out and enjoy all of those. But then somebody will go and find one that has exceptionally large white blooms on that and maybe call that Cherokee Princess. They might find one that has sort of a, a deep, almost red coloration, call that Cherokee Chief. And then the next one I put in here is one that's called Cherokee Braid. So these are what we call cultivars. They're cultivated varieties. It's a variation that was found in nature, but we continue to cultivate it and propagate for this consistent kind of qualities. Again, they, we sell so many of them. I, uh, you know, you just, you just pick and choose what suits your needs, what suits your preference. These, I think, were some that were developed, I believe, down in Tennessee or Kentucky. Um, there's a whole nother series that are developed up in, uh, you know, Rutgers, and there's some that are developed out of Maryland. Uh, they have, there's another an old one called Cloud Nine that's really prolific. And, and we have all of these and more available. Got a fantastic selection in stock now. So, you know, um, don't get hung up on a particular name. Get hung up really on what you want and expect out of that particular dogwood. Now, Another one that I want to show you, a different type of dogwood that you'll see coming up here is another native dogwood. Uh, this is one that's Cornus alternifolia. Uh, again, it's been moved into a different genus. I'm using the old names on, but this is a native dogwood. Uh, what happens though is it doesn't have those really big showy bracts like our flowering dogwood does. This still has that cluster of blooms in there. And it still has a lot of the fantastic qualities um, that's out there, but you rarely, rarely see this one planted in the landscape. I think it's just kind of a cool tree, especially if you're uh, looking into sort of native plantings. It's uh, got all the same qualities that it blooms later in these seasons, as you can see when the leaves are on there. I love that horizontal kind of branching. Truth be told, I would drive past this tree every day. It's along my daily commute for years. From, as I drive by, it kept looking like a viburnum. It kept looking like a viburnum, but the flowering sequence and the timing just wasn't right. And then it was, um, again, me pulling off the road, you know, trying to be careful not to create a safety hazard, getting out there and getting a closer look. And I was like, wow. So this what we call alternate leaf 
um, dogwood, instead of those leaves occurring in pairs, they sometimes occur, we say alternate each other, sometimes a little bit of world leaf arrangement, so slight variation. And I've got a close up image here that also shows what happens on the flowers uh, where it does not have those big um, flowery bracts on there, but still interesting. It still gives us the, um, the berries on there, even though it looks different for good wildlife value. Uh, and it does have a, a pretty decent fall coloration on there. So I just put this in here, give you an idea. Hey, there is some variation. There are some choices on that. So what I'm going to do right now is change a little bit of a direction on you and share what I'll call, hey, maybe this is sort of bad news, kind of good news, bad news. And, and when I say that, every single plant out there, you know, gets some kind of pest or disease. I don't like to overemphasize it, but that's my job. That's what I do is deal with the, um, the ugly side of gardening, as I often say. So let's look at some of the pests. Uh, dogwood borer is the most single most significant uh, insect pest that we're going to find on dogwoods. From a biological perspective, it's interesting because that is actually a moth. That's a moth who is mimicking or pretending to be a wasp. Uh, so it even has the clear wings on there. You can see the body markings, the uh, uh, stripes in there. Pretty intimidating, pretty uh, effective disguise, you know, to think you might be able to sting or, or fend for yourself. But that is a, the people, a pest, I mean, it is as harmless as any other little moth and it's defenseless as any other little moth would be. Uh, but this is a native um, insect. And what she does is she likes to lay her eggs in the cracks and crevices and wounds and injuries, the little openings that might exist on dogwoods and then when those eggs hatch they tunnel in and that's that close-up image of where the larvae starts chewing underneath the bark so you don't see these this is where somebody has pulled the bark away so we can actually see what's going underneath the bark my next picture shows what you actually will see on there so this this tree you can look at and say hey well it's kind of um you know thin sparse uh, you're seeing a little bit of uh, dieback in the in the canopy, you know, a dead branch here and there. So the tree is obviously in this declining state of health. Uh, and when we get a closer look at it, the dogwood board pretty much exclusively, I mean, there, there's always going to be an exception, but they go down the lower part of the trunk. They tend to lay their eggs oftentimes right at the soil line um, or right near, you know, along that main trunk and you'll start to see the bark cracking and splitting and flaking like that because this little larvae is chewing around behind the bark of the tree, causing that bark to separate off, and also that's cutting off the flow of water and nutrients. And I've got another close-up here, just what you can look for if you're trying to diagnose and understand the problem. So you can see right there at the soil line. Now, one of the things that I'm with dogwood borer they are absolutely attracted towards stressed trees. If a tree's in a stress condition, if it has a wound or an injury, it starts putting out, you know, aromatic compounds in there. And these insects zero in on that. They, they know exactly they're programmed for that. And that's where they're going to go after that tree. So if you are able to put a dogwood in the right cultural conditions, and this is where I'm saying where they really thrive is kind of the edge of the woods environment. Dogwoods, if you put them in really deep shade, they live and grow, but they're thin and don't bloom quite as well. If you put them out in full hot sun, oftentimes they get stressed. They're a little more subject and prone to injuries, just from human activity. And that's the ones where I start to see this borer problem go in. So to me, the easiest way to avoid borers is one is have a, a mulched area to, to protect it so we don't run into it um, and we don't create wounds or injuries on it. And two, if it can get a, a little bit of shade, shade from that really intense hot afternoon sun, because if the tree is in good health, getting good care, we can avoid a lot of the borer problems. If, however, you run into the borer, I just want to touch on a little bit of how we manage that. So our next picture, here is just a quick look at the um, life cycle. With this, there's one generation a year. So basically what that means is, hey, the adults are out flying around, finding each other mating, 
in you know May June time period. That's where they start to lay their eggs, and then they spend the winter months in the um, under the bark in the cambium layer. So they're not out there active now, but if you have this pest uh, or need to be proactive for some reason on the management of it, the timing is very, very critical because we have to spray the trunk of the tree. Now I'm not talking about up in the canopy, but the lower part of the tree, we need to tr spray it with, these are a couple of insecticide names in there to prevent them from reinfesting or gaining entry into that. So. We can manage this pest, but it's the kind of thing we want you to bring pictures, good observations, let us help you at the clinic with diagnosis, and then we'll also help you as far as control recommendations going. Now I'm going to switch over to diseases. Um, so diseases are really probably more problematic than the insects uh, it, with dogwoods. So I, these ones say, hey, like septoria leaf spot and the spot anthracnose, these are just different fungal pathogens and there are others, uh, but they, they're not really that harmful to the tree. They're spots, they're blemishes. Uh, you'll see this occur uh, sometimes, like the uh, spot anthracnose can start out very early in spring, causing these little specks or spots on the leaves, even on the bracts of the flowers. As it warms up, we start seeing septoria, uh, just cosmetic damage, but like if you're growing one of the variegated leaf varieties or something, you're growing it for the pretty leaves and if it gets these spots all over, um, that is definitely a, kind of a detraction. There's also another one I'll show you in our next picture here, which is the um, spot anthrop or dogwood anthracnose. This first showed up uh, probably about 25, 30 years ago, first became aware of it. Um, it starts out looking as that little harmless leaf spot but this particular pathogen actually continues to move into the vascular tissue causing cankers. It causes symptoms that are very similar to that dogwood borer where you start to see stunted growth, you know, early leaf drop, branch die back, and progresses on towards killing the tree. But this is caused by a fungal pathogen, has totally different kind of um, management regime. And we were really scared when it first showed up, thinking, hey, this is going to be like this. People were even saying this is going to like wipe out our native population of dogwoods. But in reality, what happened is, you know, nature is resilient. Um, it came in like it's a storm with this disease, killed off a lot of trees, had a lot of mortality. But there were also trees that were left behind that developed a resistance to this pathogen. Um, and we still have a beautiful collection of native dogwoods. We've got dogwoods for the landscape, dogwoods that were selected for resistance to some of these kind of diseases. Mildew, that's in my next picture, is just another fungal pathogen. Um, again, I love our native dogwood and I still encourage its planting. Mildew, uh, again, this was a mutation. Mildew has been around, you know, probably as long as mankind has been uh, or longer. But again, it has these mutations, variations, and so we never saw mildew was not a dogwood pathogen, not at all, up until about 30 years ago. And then there's a little mutation, and now it's fairly common. This is, uh, again, this is, does not kill trees, does not cause any injury, just takes away from their cosmetic value. So a lot of times when you're coming in the plant clinic, I'm trying to sort of help people every, you know, kind of understand what it is, why it's occurring, uh, and give you options, which may range from you just learn to live with it, um, there are treatment things available to you if you want to treat it. You know, if it's a real specimen important plant in your front yard and you choose that option, uh, we have effective treatments. But another one that I want to say is there are some more disease resistant dogwoods that we're going to take a quick look at and then I'll open up for questions. Uh, so Cornus cusa, uh, this is the Asiatic species of dogwood. So we've been talking about a couple of our native dogwoods like Cornus florida and the Cornus alternifolia. And we also, I feel like I have to mention, there's a lot of other dogwoods that grow as shrubs. I just didn't have time to go into that. So this is a pretty widely uh, wide ranging group of plants that goes anywhere from kind of like a, a large shrub up to medium sized trees. Believe it or not, there's even little ground cover species in here, but this is the, the Asian form Cornus cusa. 
again, it tends to flower a little bit later in the season. Uh, if our native dogwoods are flowering for us, let's say in early, mid-April, uh, Cornus cusa doesn't kick in until we're pretty well into May. Uh, so it flowers at, you know, at basically the same time or right after the leaves come out. Uh, they do tend to branch close to the ground. Uh, dogwoods don't naturally develop that type of single stem structure to it. Uh, we develop that nurseryman prune them up to make it into a single stem for landscape uses, but it's very common to find them where they branch close to the ground like this. So this is in the, the bloom season that's there. Again, there's different color varieties and, and to choose from in here. And I think my next image sort of shows what it does after flowering. So I've got a close up of the blooms there. The fruit on this, the berry is much different. You can see from our native dogwood, this is the size of maybe a crab apple or something, uh, about half inch across. And so it's this kind of large fleshy fruit. Some people dislike this tree because uh, they'll say that fruit drops down and creates a mess. Uh, this, this one that I'm talking about happens to be in my front yard. I've never had that problem because the squirrels and the birds basically eat everything that this tree produces. So I've never found it to be messy, but some people do. And then again, I think it gets, um, the fall color in this gets overlooked. It's got really beautiful, as, I, as you'll see here, really brilliant uh, red fall color. If we can just bring that image up, you'll see this is that same tree um, looking at probably late October, November. So this is a tough, hardy, sturdy tree that gives us color and interest all different times throughout the year. One of the reasons I put this in that is that these uh, Kusa dogwood does not it's resistant. It does not have problems with the dogwood borer. We don't have problems with the fungal leaf spots on it or the mildew or something. So in some ways, I would say this is a totally, it's a different tree. But if you're looking for one that you don't want to deal with some of those other kind of met pest or management issues, this might be something um, that you want to consider. And then what happens with this um, is plant breeders up at Rutgers University started taking our native dogwood, the Asian dogwood, and hybridizing those. And I've got a picture of that showing up. Um, so they were called the Stellar Series, things like Aurora, Constellation, uh, you know, all these kind of astronomical or astrological sort of names that go on to it. Uh, you can see they're really intermediate between the two. They flower kind of right in between the two. So you kind of like think like a, you know, early mid-April, you know, late April, early May, and then late May, June, if you have a sequence, you know, they kind of go intermediate between them. They get the really large um, flowering bracts that's on there. But one thing I will say is this tree, these stellar dogwoods, they're sterile. So we don't get the um, fruit or berries, and that can be either a good or a bad thing. It takes away from their wildlife and ecological value because there's no berries for the wildlife on it. But from a maintenance perspective, that's one less thing we have to think about cleaning up or messing up. They get that pest, the insect disease resistance from kind of, you see with the Asian one, but like I said, a little bit earlier blooming um, and the kind of intermediate form braxis in there. And I think I've got, I think it's the um, stellar pink. That's the one I was going to say in there. Stellar pink, it starts out a little bit of a deep color, deep rose color in it, but as that expands and opens, it's more white with just some little streaks of white in there. But again, there's some new varieties that are out there. Again, Rutgers has continued to develop these, and, and we have more options both in leaf color, flower color. Um, I'm only able to scratch the surface here a little bit of time we have. This is where I'm going to Take a breather in a sense uh, that if we have any questions talking about dogwoods, I'd like to see if we can address that now. And then I'm going to come back and I've got too much to say about the salias also. We do have questions about dogwoods, so I'll jump right in, David. And this first one is making me smile because I think this is something we did like my first year on staff. Um, so this is from Timothy. He has a Virginia dogwood that he got from Maryfield for Arbor Day a few years ago. Do you remember when we did that? Yes, I do. That was a while back. Yep. And he is wondering how many years it will be before it will get that deep red fall foliage. Uh, so so let, let me say a little bit. So when you get a seedling plant, 
just a, a seed grown plant. It's going to have more genetic variation that's in there, which is good because, hey, more biodiversity, again, that variation. But it also means that the fall coloration is not going to be as consistent. So when we sell varieties, like when you go back and buy nursery stock, those are varieties that were propagated from cuttings. They're, they're basically clones, identical matches to the parent. So what I'm trying to get at is yours may not get that deep red coloration. It depends a lot on what its parentage is because that coloration, I mean, I think it's been at least five years, seven years since we did those seedling giveaways. It, it would either be showing that coloration now or maybe it's just not going to. Okay, interesting. I had never thought of that. Um, very yeah, those are little seedlings from the forest okay. department. And, and we sell seedlings because a lot of people that want strictly native, yeah, you know, no, like non-cultivated plants, we have those too. But then it's a little bit of a, an unknown exactly what you're going to get. Okay, interesting. Um, all right, next question. Should we trim up the dogwood and remove the lower branches or is this a choice? It is completely a choice. The, the low branching is the normal, natural way dogwoods grow. But sometimes in our landscape, if I want to plant, like you saw in my garden, I have under plantings. I, I want to grow some flowers and perennials and ferns and stuff on it. So we might want to plant under there. It might be visibility. It might be being able to walk. You can elevate the canopy on that. It really depends on the choice. If you're going to prune dogwoods, I would much rather do that kind of like in the middle of the winter, because like I said those borers are attracted to wounds and injuries. So I want my pruning to occur while there's really no borer activity. So if you're, if you're gonna raise the canopy, um, I would rather see you do it next winter is what I'm, I guess I'm trying to say, as opposed to doing it now or this summer. Okay. Um, I am typing this in. The next question, David, is, is the Coosa dogwood berry poisonous to, to dogs? Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and say, and you can add anything you want to it, but I'm going to send out in the chat the ASPCA pet safe plant list, which is where we refer people to generally for um, pet safe plants and non-pet safe plants. But do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I 110% support what Sally's saying. I don't like to talk about because I have no medical background, I have no veterinarian background. Um, I will say I've eaten uh, the berries off of the Coosa dogwood and I don't really like them, but it's uh, they're, they're okay for human consumption. I'm still here. And I think they're actually cultivated in, in parts of Asia as a plant. So definitely check me out on that double, you know, look at but. Not that I'm aware of, not at all. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to send that out in the chat right now so everybody can check because it's not always the same for people or dogs. We just don't exactly. like it. We like to refer that to the experts. Um, okay, next question. I have a variegated Akatsuki Kusa dogwood, but it's not flowering. Can it take a more sunny location? Right now it's in a shady understory area and it loses some of its leaves after new spring growth. I, I really appreciate that question because I forgot to mention that the uh, the Asian dog was the Kusa dog was actually performed better where they get more sunlight. Where I'm saying our our native dogwood is kind of edge habitat tree. Um, that would be another reason. Like if you've got a sunnier kind of harsher exposure, that uh, Kusa dogwoods do perform better, and that absolutely could be what's holding back yours from flowering well. Okay, that actually answers our next question. Are Kusa dogwoods more tolerant of sun? So the answer is yes. Yes. Um, all right, next question. I have a dogwood that's starting to bloom, but there is one branch that is not showing any signs of life. Can this be pruned now or should I wait until fall? No, dead branches, I would just remove if they're dead, remove them any time. What I'm more concerned about when I'm saying pruning in the winter is really with on live growth. But if it's a dead branch, um, just go ahead and take that off. And Sally, I'm kind of watching our time. Can we maybe jump to azaleas and then we'll see? I think I'll still be able to fit in azaleas. That was our last question. So you, perfect timing. Okay, excellent, excellent. Because we are going to run out of time. So of course their partner, um, azaleas. And that's why I really wanted to sort of put them together. Uh, again, azaleas is a big, huge group of plants. Um, I'm only going to talk about a few of them. So we'll start right in with the pictures. Um, most of the time when we're talking about azaleas, um, 
we're really talking about what some people might call a Japanese azalea. These are the evergreen forms. Uh, so we have, like I even brought in here right next to me, this is a rhododendron paracliminoides or the pinkster bloom azalea. This is an example of what our native azaleas. And I love, love, love this plant. Um, but when we're talking, most of the time we're talking about these Asiatic forms that have the evergreen leaves, they tend there's early mid-season late flowering varieties, but they tend to bloom really in the month of April as their primary bloom season. And these are just uh, some pretty pictures to show just a little small sense of the range of colors that they come into. But so these are the ones that we really rely on a lot and will be popping into bloom next month. Uh, next, I just want to give you a little quick, quick overview. The next one is a later flowering variety. Um, this is one that really you can see there in the image, this picture was taken in June. So you can have, we have some members of the uh, rhododendron group, not exactly Sally's, but we're right, right at the very, very beginning of their bloom season now, starting to bud, swell, and take on some color. And we can have late flowering varieties that go all the way through June. Um, this particular one, again, is a very low growing, small uh, dwarf variety or sometimes called sort of a satsuki type azaleas and again there's a range of colors and varieties and sizes that go in there but what a fantastic plant you know evergreen uh, again shade tolerant grows in the same kind of conditions as like a dogwood does our native dogwood i was saying hey if i put really thick heavy dense shade they may get thin and sparse if i put it really full hot sun um, they get a little bit stressed out their happy place is somewhere in between those extremes and then there's also some that are um, that will flower for us both early and late uh, that we look at here. These are um, this is what's called an encore azalea. My next picture here. Uh, this picture you can see was taken in October. So I'm talking about a plant that I can have flowers in April, May, June, um, again October, November. Uh, during that mid-season though, we don't, that hot summer months, we don't really have any fills that void. One of the things I like to stress is, um, again, you can see I took this picture back in uh, just this past October, the way these plants work, uh, it took me a while to figure this out in confusion, is the life cycle on, on an azalea is, like I said, they're, they're starting to bud up now. Those buds open into a profusion of blooms, let's say in April, at the end of the bloom cycle, boom, they start growing. They actually form their flower buds usually around August. So the flowering decision is made in August. On this group of azaleas, it's called Encore azaleas or Bloomathon azaleas. Again, many different ones there. You'll have some of the flowers like this, a, a, an interesting but not huge prolific flower. Some of those blossoms will often open in the fall. We go through the winter, and the others then open for us in spring. So their flowering is spread out over more weeks or more months, even more seasons. So it's kind of like the same plant, same growth characteristics, same management. It's just these open and kind of sequentially, they don't all open at the same time. So it really, again, comes down to what you want um, and what you like. I'm like a traditionalist, as you can tell. I like the ones that give me a big show of color, you know, in spring, as opposed to other people really like this where that, that blossom is spread out over a longer period of time. But it's, it can, it's so nice to have these different choices that are out there. Um, so with that, oh, one last thing, I want to show a slide and then I've got a little video on that. Because uh, we're talking about all this color, I, I, we never talk about the fall coloration that's in here. Uh, one of my colleagues I work with, Terry and I, he brought to my attention. He's like, wow, the prettiest part of the nursery right now is in the azaleas. We just rounded up. This is a selection of different varieties. The one that's behind me right here, for example, this is Stewartsonia. You can see it has really that deep plum color in it. And, you know, some of the white colored varieties, they shed a lot of their leaves and kind of go yellow. We never really planned for this, but if you're into it, hey, also think about the foliage characteristics. It's not just the um, flowers that's on there. So what I want to do right now is I've got a little bit short video here. It's a couple minutes. It's going to talk to you about how we care for the azaleas, and then we'll come back uh, for a couple pest issues and questions. Hi, 
I'm here to share some tips with you on how to keep your azaleas and rhododendrons looking terrific. As soon as they finish blooming, this is the ideal time to go in and prune and fertilize them. But before we start cutting, we need to set some goals and objectives of why we are pruning them. So this plant that we're looking at today is in good health, but it's gotten a little bit overgrown and it's a little bit misshapen. So I'm going to go in and use a technique that I call selective thinning. By reaching down inside the plant and taking selective branches out, it helps to retain the natural form and shape of the plant. I target my cuts to cut where that branch naturally divides or forks. That helps with the plant and the healing process from the pruning and as well as maintaining the natural shape. So when we've completed, you look at this and realize I've reduced the size by about 25%, but it still looks like an azalea. Now azaleas respond really well to pruning and you can be as vigorous as you want. You can prune back to almost any height or shape you need. But with rhododendrons, their close relatives, I have to be a little more stingy with them. I don't like to cut back in the old growth. So I go in, deadhead it, pull off the old spent flower blooms just to make it look prettier. And then again, do a little bit of selective thinning out the tips of the branch to maintain that density. Once we've completed our pruning, this is also the ideal time to fertilize them. I'm using Maryfield flowering plant food, which will help to encourage good, healthy growth, set flower buds later this summer and reward us with gorgeous blooms next spring. So one thing I, I wanted to mention is um, we, we don't currently have the flowering plant food in stock. We did at the time I made the video. But Hollytone is a really good fertilizer to put on your azaleas. Also, this is an organic fertilizer. It's formulated specifically for azaleas, rhododendrons, hollies, uh, plants that like a more acidic soil condition. So that is certainly a good option when it comes time for that. Uh, we also have this one from Fertilome, that, which is a more traditional uh, synthetic fertilizer, uh, which is really a big difference when we go organic. We got Hollytone. Oh, we've got this Azalea and Camellia food. So uh, the flowering plant food, we're working on that. Hope we can get it back on the shelf soon. But we've always got alternatives and options to say. I'm going to go back to my pictures real quick here, and I'm going to show you um, the after picture. So you saw when I was pruning that plant, this is the next spring. Just want to show you, it came out dense, full, prolific, you know, loaded up with blooms because they if they flower in April, I do my pruning in May. Uh, that's also about the time we're going to fertilize them. Like I said, with holly tone or fertilone. Then they're growing May, June, July, set their buds, and then they're already open next spring. Let me hit on just two pest issues uh, before we get back to our questions. Real quick, the number one insect pest we run into is this Azalea lace bug. Um, sometimes people say, hey, their, their plants are just losing their color. The leaves are turning white. And if you flip it over, if you look on the underside of that leaf, you start to see all these little black specks and mess and everything. This is a little insect um, that, that feeds on the bottom of the leaf and their mouth is just like a little syringe and they poke the leaf and they suck the juice out of it and lead to that kind of discoloration. Uh, it's, a, it's a problem because they have three generations a year. So they can emerge in spring, usually sometime like April, May, then they mate and have babies, and then their babies mate and have babies. And by late summer, uh, we can have pretty serious pest issue on there. Uh, normally, what I like to do, I, of course, we always like to get a good confirmation on this. And at this point, I'm usually talking to you about systemic um, insecticide treatment because it's hard to get good coverage on the bottom of the leaves. So if you're trying to use something like neem oil, horticultural oil, it depends on you getting really good coverage on the bottom of the leaf of an azalea, which is often thick and dense, so that's hard to do, but it's something that's pretty easy to manage. What's a more serious problem is this root rot disease of azaleas, rhododendrons. Um, I just think even dogwoods get this, lots of different plants get it, but this is a water mold pathogen and what happens that's a genetically it's more closely aligned with brown algae than it is a fungi. So it moves, it spreads, it migrates, it infects plants through the film of moisture, through the water that's in the soil. So these are plants that absolutely will not 
tolerate wet soil conditions. You, they are pretty susceptible to this pathogen. And if they're planted in an area that's excessively moist, poorly drained, or if you're watering them too much, this pathogen gets into the roots. Uh, what I'm trying to show on that rhododendron, the plant looks like it's wilting. It starts, the leaves roll up, it starts to droop. Um, a lot of times the reaction is, oh, I better water. Um, but what's really happened here is this pathogen gets into the roots, the vascular tissue makes the way in the stem, and it's killing that vascular tissue so the plant's not able to absorb water. The close-up image shows where somebody has um, scratched the bark off. The healthy tissue, good healthy plant tissue, has that white coloration where you see that brown streaking. That is infected, and if we get to that point of damage, you know, it's probably beyond salvaging. If we can catch this early in the game, we do have some treatment options, but absolutely, we really have to look after the drainage, avoid wet conditions, um, and just don't go the other side where they dry out completely. I only have a few minutes left, so let's just get to the questions now, because um, I feel like I'm not really giving justice to any of these plants, but, but we can get you uh, hopefully excited about enough to come in and learn more or maybe even buy more. <laughs> well, all right, we'll get through as many questions as we can. Um, first question, I bought several new azaleas from Maryfield last year. One has leaves and the other has none. Is the one with no leaves dead? So we always recommend you do what I call the scratch test. Um, some azaleas like this, I realize this is a different species, but like this azalea is perfectly healthy and live and not a leaf on it. What I'm going to ask you to do is you can pick a stem and just with your fingernail or something, go in there and scratch under the bark a little bit. If it's green and juicy in here, if the twig's still pliable, then it's still alive. If you go and it's dry and brittle and that twig snaps off, um, it's dead. If you have a, a dead tree or shrub, um, we want to hear from you. We What we really like is, you know, if you bring the plant in or at least it brings samples and pictures in. Uh, let's look at, talk to you about. Uh, we do have a replacement policy on trees and shrubs for the first 12 months. Uh, you know, we can help you as far as um, finding a new one also. Okay, uh, next question. My azaleas are very leggy. Will, helping, will cutting them back help with this? Yes, um, and I do this, I think one is I'd like, I pretty much like to prune azaleas on an annual basis. Um, but if you have old plants that have gotten leggy and overgrown, uh, they respond really well to what I call renewal pruning. Still, don't do that yet. Um, just even those tall and leggy, we've been waiting all year. They're going to be flowering for us in the next week or two. So go ahead and just, you know, enjoy the flowers. At the end of that bloom season, um, once you say, well, the flowers are pretty much faded, we're done for this year. You can prune them just like we showed in that video, um, and you can get much more aggressive than I have done there. And that does induce the plant to put up new shoots so you can rejuvenate it. It's just like we showed in that video. Go in there, prune it, fertilize it. Um, you'll be back in business this summer with a fuller, more robust plant. Okay. Do you recommend fertilizing your azaleas once a year or twice? So I, again, uh, I look at fertilizer just as optional. Um, if it's a very young plant and I want it to grow faster or get bigger, promote more growth, maybe I do fertilize it twice a year. Uh, if it's an old plant and it's looking good and it's already grown up and blocking the windows or something, then I don't fertilize it at all. So this really, uh, it's totally optional based on where you are with the plants. I think that best and most important time to fertilize them is right after the flowering. So that'll probably be next month. Uh, but whether you choose to fertilize or not is really up to you. If the plants looks good, it's healthy, it's growing, it's flowering, um, serving all its purposes, you don't have to fertilize it. If you want, it's not blooming well, or you're trying to promote more growth, then yes, go ahead and fertilize it. Okay. Um, next question. When is a good time to transplant azaleas? Azaleas are like the easiest plant in the world to transplant. I have moved them in the middle of summer, the middle of winter. Um, they have a nice fibrous root system that root balls hold together well. May maybe transplant it right now or maybe wait until after the flowers. There's a, there's a slight chance that if you transplant it right now, 
that might disrupt the flowering just for this spring. Um, so depending on what your circumstances are, you know, you, you could go for it right now if you want to play it safe and say, well, let me just hang in there a couple more weeks, enjoy the flowers, then transplant it. Um, that would be a little more cautious, safer way to do it. Okay. Um, all right. I know we're about at time. I'm going to give you a couple more if, if that's okay. Oh, I'm, um, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, if anybody has to go, we are recording. So if you want to follow up with any questions, uh, you can get the recording by emailing me or you can send me or or David um, an email and we'll follow up with you if you have to go. Uh, all right. Next question. I have lost all of my encores and bloomathons. They just struggle and fade away. I've tried part shade and sun. Um, a couple were up to zone six. So I'm assuming that means they can tolerate pretty cold weather. Do you know what the problem might be? Uh, no, we'd, we'd really have to talk one-on-one -on -one and look at samples and everything. Uh, so the, the Blumathon azaleas, they, they were developed down Louisiana. And at first, for the first several years, we wouldn't carry them because we just didn't feel rock solid on their cold hardiness. But they've continued to improve the breeding. You know, our climate got a little bit warmer. And they've been doing pretty well here, you know, for the last many years. So cold hardiness is a little bit of a thing on them. They do tolerate a little more sun and that kind of warm conditions. First thing I'm going to say is, you know, we I'd really be talking to you about drainage. Because one thing that they are not going to put up with is heavy, dense, poorly drained or wet soil. So... Given the kind of histories there, that's that's the first thing I think I'd be looking at. Okay. Um, here's a question about leaf, uh, losing leaves. In late fall or winter, is it usual for a significant number of azalea leaves to turn yellow and fall off? This seems to happen every year, but the plants seem fine. Yeah, that's, that's again, there's a huge variability that's in there. Some of the varieties, I always think of the ones that are lavender or white, where they have a little bit larger, kind of softer leaf, some of those will leave lose, you know, 80, 90% of their foliage. And that's just a normal sequence that goes on there. There are some series, like there's a, what we call Gerard, and they might have Gerard Rose, you know, Gerard Red. Um, that's a series that was developed for better leaf retention, you know, looking at the leaf quality and evergreen that's in there. Uh, I mentioned like Stuart Sonia, one that's over my shoulder is here. Uh, there's a lot of these varieties. I think this uh, might be coral bells behind me. These names, because there's over thousands of them. But if if that's an important value for you, then talk with our salespeople, and and we can help you through that process. But but your plant's healthy; it's probably behaving normally. Uh, it's just that variety. The okay. one that I'll show you, Chinzans, my front yard. I picked it out. I'd never seen the flower. I picked it out because of the size the location, the leaf quality, it's on there. Uh, it just turned out to have a beautiful flower. Okay. Um, all right, back to Cusa and native dogwoods for a moment. Should you fertilize those trees? And if so, when? Uh, so it's the same thing uh, that I said before. I think the best time to fertilize them is right about now, just at the very start of the season when they're coming out of their dormancy. Uh, I would say this is just like taking a vitamin. Um, the soil provides the minerals that that plant needs to grow. But if, the, if it's a young plant or it's distressed, or if you're trying to promote more growth on it, improve the flowering, you can fertilize it, um, which may improve that kind of growth quality on there. Uh, so yeah, that time is coming up, you know, right now. And I say, hey, it could be now, it could be, you know, March, April, May, um, you know, even early June, but but this spring, and this is a good time to do that. You kind of set your goals for the plant. The plant does not require that you fertilize it. Um, it's a question of how you want to manage it, what your expectations are for the plant. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see how many we can get to. One or two more. Uh, will leaf grow work as a plant-based fertilizer for azaleas, rhododendrons, camellias? Is, could you use, could you use leaf grow? Uh, leaf grow doesn't really have much of a nutrient value to it. I'm I'm all about leaf grow. I top dress my own garden leaf grow just this past week, you know, just trying to get caught up. Leaf grow is going to improve the condition of the soil. It's going to improve the biology of the soil. It's not 
really adding a whole lot of nutrients into that. So it's really a couple of different things. I'm totally with you on the leaf grow, but if you actually want to fertilize the plants then something like a polytone, which is basically chicken manure with other ingredients in conjunction with the leaf grow, um, these things can work together. It would be a very good thing to do. Okay. Um, all right. Can, I'm not sure I'm familiar with this. Can swamp azalea handle wet feet? I'm still going to say no, even though that name is a little bit misleading. Swamp azalea is often, that's one of our native varieties that tends to shed its leaves. Um, maybe more moisture tolerant than some of the sort of Japanese ones that we're talking about, but not standing water, not, not really wet conditions. Moist, okay, but uh, I think that name is a little bit misleading. They will get the same root rot problems and die. Um, if it's put in an area that stays wet over a persistent long period of time. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. We'll we'll do a few more. <laughs> We've only got like five left. If that's okay. All right, you decide. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm like we we should be fine. I just am like I know it's a busy time of year. Um, I know right. we're running over, but, but that's okay. That's all right. Uh, should one preemptively put out a systemic pesticide for azaleas? I don't believe in that. Um, again, there's different different ideas, different approaches. I don't treat a problem unless there is a problem. Uh, okay. These things are not harmless. These uh, pesticides, that's what side means to kill, you know, so so I'm trying to be as conservative as possible with that and only treat a problem if it exists. But that, okay. that's me. I, somebody else might uh, give you different advice and I, I'm not going to say they're wrong, but I just don't go that way. Okay. Um, all right. This next question is from Ashley, and I feel for Ashley because I have problems with mealybugs at my home. Um, she has an encore azalea, which has mealybugs, and she can't seem to get rid of them by manually removing them and applying rubbing alcohol. What would you recommend to try instead? Uh, so I recommend you bring us a sample for starters because I think you have the problem di incorrectly diagnosed. Could be, yeah. I think what you have is, is called azalea bark scale. Oh, okay. and we need to confirm the diagnosis and there's specific time scale insects. Um, the timing can have a huge influence on your success or failure of control. So if you, um, if you're not able to get to the clinic, then definitely send Sally some pictures to the, so I can get a look at that. I think this begins with getting a, a solid diagnosis. Sounds good. Um, yes. Okay. Next. What can I do with my rhododendron that is woody? I'm wondering if this, this probably means pruning it. Does it, can you prune, you can't prune the rhododendron, ro, rhododendrons. Rhododendron. I don't like to. Okay. Um, there's, there's risk is the, probably the way I like to answer this. You can take a rhododendron, an old woody thick rhododendron and prune it real aggressively, um, but it's very difficult to predict how that plant's going to respond to it. I have seen rhododendrons cut back severely to a stump and they rejuvenate, renew, and come back. I've also seen rhododendrons, you do that and they die. So I, again, I don't like to do that. I like to keep my pruning real stingy on there. If you are at a point where you're willing to accept the risk and say, look, this thing is just huge is blocking the front door. I can't get in, you know, it's like, I got nothing to lose. Then go ahead and try it, but understand that how the plant reacts is pretty unpredictable. You would still wait and do that after it flowers. So you're probably still six weeks out from actually doing that pruning. So, so proceed at your own risk is maybe how I, I'll summarize that. Okay. Um, all right. Do you have any recommendations on color combinations for azaleas? All one shade or a variety of different ones? How do you decide? Is it all personal preference or is there any advantage to switch mixing it up? That is totally personal preference because I like to work myself within very simple color schemes, you know, just maybe two or three complementary colors. And then I'll go buy somebody's property that's just this hodgepodge explosion of color. And I think, wow, that's really pretty cool. I like that. Uh, I, I don't know how to answer that. I tend to stay very simple. Um, like I said, my, my own personal views, you know, I, like, so I have three azaleas and they're all the same color, the same variety. You know, I like that kind of uniformity and consistency, but I'll go through um, 
again, I, I grew up kind of Arlington Falls Church area, and it used to be a tradition. We go down Prosperity Lane, and some of these old properties that had these gorgeous azaleas of every color, just no pattern or rhyme, and, and you just kind of jewel over it. So I, I don't have an answer. No preference. Okay, whatever you like. No, no I don't even get into it. I'll give you, you ask me that question, now I'll give you a different answer every time. <laughs> yeah, my uh, balcony definitely falls under the explosion of color category. Um, I have azaleas growing on a hillside with ivy. Should I cut the ivy from around the wood? Yes, the ivy is not doing you any favors. Of, you know, they want to climb up into the plants, which is, um, you know, blocking sun. You know, it's just reducing the air circulation, could be leading to other pest issues, competing for water nutrients. It's if you're if you're willing and able to put the maintenance into it, I would um, pull that ivy away from the azaleas. Okay. All right. This is our last question. So thanks everybody. All for right. We're going to make it. All right. What type of azalea is, I guess the question is, is there any really, is there any type of azalea that is more tolerant of wet soil for people struggling with drainage? Try and think through if there's a variety or close relative. You know, some of our native azaleas, and again, these are really pretty, but you kind of have to understand, and they're deciduous um, that's that's in here. Um, they naturally grow in moist woodland environments. So again, I don't want to say wet, but, you know, they'll tolerate moisture a little bit better. Because uh, you'll see, you'll find them growing along stream valleys and stuff, but not standing water. Of uh, now, the, the others like going off in different groups of plants, but but we have a nice collection of these natives, a couple, two or three different varieties. I think we might have, again, this they call it pinkster bloom. Sometimes you get roseum, uh, but it's just a different plant. Taller, uh, deciduous, but they get really colorful flowers, sometimes fragrant blooms on. It's worth researching that. Interesting. Okay. All right. Well, that concludes all of our questions. Thank you, everybody. Um, I see almost everybody stayed on through the whole thing. So, Ruth, great deal. Um, we have a class this weekend at the Fair Oaks store on roses. For anyone who is interested, uh, Pam Powers is the consulting rosarian for the Arlington Rose Foundation. She's going to be coming in to teach a class. Um, that's at 10 a.m. at Fair Oaks. You can find that on our website. And I think that's probably the only announcement I would have. David, is there anything you want to close out with? Um, I want to remind people we got these beautiful, beautiful plants. Come and see us. Uh, it is spring, but keep in mind our average frost date is kind of like late April. So we've had, again, several people calling us asking about tomatoes. And we're saying, well, we're still about two weeks out before we're going to get that. Um, so definitely come in and see us, but also don't let the mild temperatures fool you. We can still get some uh, cold weather. So some of the tender stuff, uh, we, we're not, we're just holding off being conservative on that. Sounds good. Yeah, we had a couple of people ask about basil. I know it's going to be a little bit longer. Um, yeah, well, right. it's 37 degrees at my home this morning. That's what I'm saying. It's like we get lured <laughs> into this, but we're not there yet. Not quite there, but so, so close. And we do have, I, I, I heard the garden center looks amazing. So, um, all righty. Well, David, nice to see you as always. Great chatting. And uh, everybody, thanks so much for joining us today. I sent my email out into the chat. If you have questions, please feel free to follow up and have a great day. Bye, right. Dave. Thanks, everyone.